going to have church. I, I know that there's going to be some, even in our church, disagree with that decision. And my thing is, if you disagree, stay home. Okay? If, you, if you're worried about catching something, we're not going to judge you. I mean, it's okay. You just stay home. Uh, again, it would be just like at the beginning. If you are sick, please stay home. Um, if you are in the high-risk category, uh, that is, you have a compromised immune system, uh, for, again, for the time being, just stay home. And uh, so we're not going to, we're not, it's not, it's for those who just say, I have got to go to church, yeah. right? Yeah. I, and I'm one of them. I mean, it's just, it's been too long. So, uh, again, possibly this, this coming next Sunday, but I'll, I'll let you know. But I think it's pretty likely the Sunday after that. So we'll see. Um, along that line, as we start opening up things and we're trying to get back to more normal uh, church activities, Vacation Bible School is at the very least uh, postponed because we just simply will not have enough time to get everything together. Um, so what we're, we're going to do is when we do come back together as a church, we'll have Vacation Bible School meeting and we'll decide you know, what we're going to do uh, as far as when we'll when, uh, may, and possibly even if we'll have Bible school this summer, so we'll talk about it. Uh, Brother Tolly, I rescheduled him for next Sunday. Uh, he had to cancel first meeting because of the, his back, and so we rescheduled him for next week. Well, again, because of the uncertainty, uh, we just decided that we would cancel again, and he's going to come back in August. So we're going to get him here this year, Lord willing. Uh, but we're, again, it's going to be uh, delayed. Okay, um, I think that's all I need to tell you at this time. I will say that when we start back up, like if we start on a Sunday morning, the services that follow will be started back up also. So Wednesday night and Friday night, our addiction program. I've got, I've got some big concerns uh, about uh, actually the whole thing, but uh, again, looking at our church family, um, we... You know, the mental health issues, they're not talking about that nearly enough. The, the uh, financial issues that people are facing as we keep everything locked down. The uh, folks that are dealing with addictions. Uh, my, my fear is that if, a, if they weren't dealing with addictions when they went into this, they might be dealing with addictions by the time we come out of it. So uh, I just feel like that we need to try uh, being safe as we can, you know, Practicing social distancing, that's a new thing now. Uh, I don't think we're going to come in and start hugging and handshaking and all that stuff. We'll see. Uh, but but we do, I think we do very much need to look at uh, possibly getting back together here soon. All right, Snake, if you want to come up and sing, we would love that. On, there, yeah, there we go. go. There we go. Well, good morning, everybody. Good morning. Good morning. Good to virtually see you out there. <laughs> <laughs> um, you know, in these uncertain times, there is definitely one thing that we can count on, and that is that we know that God is there, and we know that He is a keeper of His promises, and. Amen. We know what he's promised us. Amen. So this song is uh, really significant this morning. So if y'all want to sing along at home, feel free. <laughs> sing loud so we can hear you. <laughs> <laughs> Be real loud. Blessed assurance, Jesus is mine. Oh, what a
Christ's name we pray. Amen. Amen. All right, the thrust of this chapter is comfort. We've been looking at that theme since we began John chapter 14. Jesus is trying to console his disciples on the eve of his departure. In seeking to comfort them, he's made some very precious promises. First of all, he spoke of going to prepare, prepare something for his disciples. In John 14, 3, Jesus said, And if I go and prepare a place for you, I will come again and receive you unto myself, that where I am, there he may be also. So he spoke of preparing something for them. Secondly, he spoke of sending something to them. In verse 16, he said, I will pray the Father, and he shall give you another comforter, that he may abide with you forever. So he promised to prepare something. He promised to send something. Uh, now he promises to leave something. Uh, leave something to his disciples and directly, and then to you and I. We see that in verse 27. Jesus said, Peace I leave with you. My peace I give unto you, not as the world giveth give I unto you. Let not your heart be troubled, neither let it be afraid. It's interesting to me that how God has a way of, of bringing to our hearts the word that we need. Okay? I mean, I've been preaching through John's gospel uh, for many months now. And, and this study I've done it before takes, I think, about three and a half years. Some people might say, well, why in the world would you do that? Well, first of all, it, it's, it is a guarantee that you're going to hear from God and not me. If I could pick, if I was a, a man that would preach uh, only topical sermons, there are some things that I, would, that I would just get stuck on. And you would hear that over and over and over again. But when we go through verse by verse, we go through a book of the Bible, we can be assured that we're hearing what God wants us to hear. Amen? Amen. And, and it amazes me at how timely. Like we're coming to this passage this morning in the midst of a uh, pandemic, in the midst of a, a troubling and trying time, maybe because of the pandemic directly, uh, but maybe we're, we're struggling with the fallout of the pandemic. It's affecting people, I think, uh, mentally, and it's affecting them emotionally, and it's affecting them financially. So there are a lot of concerns. And, you know, it, 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 we can say that we're living in a crazy time, right? Uh, for years, I, I've said from this very pulpit, for years I've said, you might wake up in the morning to a totally different world. Well, we're here. And, and I don't think that, you know, I'm not saying that this is the only time that we're going to face like this, but we're here now. Things are different. There's just a, a lot of uncertainty, a lot of things going on right now. And, and the thing is, though, though there's a lot of uncertainty in the world, there is a place where we can find peace. Uh, a pet place in a crazy, crazy, crazy world. A place that, in, a, in a world that has fallen. And we have all of the effects of the, of the fall of man. We can find peace. And, and again, I didn't force this message. God is giving it to us at just the right time. Jesus said, peace I leave with you. My peace I give you. No, I want to do this like I would with the children. Not as the world give, give I unto you. Let not your heart be troubled, neither let it be afraid. Isn't that a message that we need today? Let not your heart be troubled, neither let it be afraid. This is Christ's legacy. Uh, a legacy is something received from an ancestor or predecessor from the past. This is what we receive from Christ as his followers. It's one of the priceless intangibles that we talk about a lot around here. Peace, joy, uh, contentment. Uh, something that we have as a relationship, as a result of a relationship with God through the Lord Jesus Christ. So we're going to look this morning at 
Christ's legacy. Now, what exactly is his legacy? Christ is our predecessor. His legacy is peace. Again, verse 27. Peace I leave with you. My peace I give unto you. Not, not as the world give, give I unto you. Let not your heart be troubled, neither let it be afraid. Christ left to us peace, a sure peace. The legacy of our Lord Jesus Christ, noted Spurgeon, is binding. We may rest well assured that this testament of the Lord Jesus Christ is valid. You have, he said, his own signature. It is signed, sealed, and delivered in the presence of the 11 apostles who are faithful and true witnesses. He goes on to say that it's the true testament, not in force while the tester liveth, but Jesus Christ has died once for all, and now none can dispute his legacy. The will is in force because the tester died. It may, however, sometimes happen that the tester's wishes in a will may be disregarded. Uh, and he, powerless beneath the sod, is quite unable to rise and demand that his last will should be carried out. But our Lord Jesus Christ, who died and therefore made his will valid, rose again. And now he lives to see that every stipulation of it is carried out. Hallelujah. Yeah. So Christ's legacy is sure because Christ ever lives to enforce it. Now, his legacy is peace, but what do we mean by that? Christ's legacy is peace. Well, when Jesus said, peace I leave with you, what did he mean? You see, in the world, when we talk about peace, we often talk about the cessation of hostilities or, or an absence of conflict or an absence of turmoil or an absence of, of an unsettled state of mind. The, the dictionary defines it as a, a state of tranquility or quiet. Now, this would definitely not be at Jones Daycare, I can tell you that right now. There is no peace there by the world's definition. Um, when we think of peace, again, we, what do we often think about? We think about a, a quiet, peaceful scene. Uh, Boyce notes in his commentary on John, it says, The story has occasionally been told of a contest in which the artist was to submit paintings and sculptures portraying their understanding of peace. Some showed beautiful sunsets, others pastoral scenery. But the prize went to an artist who had painted a bird in a nest attached to a branch protruding <coughs> excuse me, from the edge of a thundering waterfall. By the way, that's not the carnivorous virus, that's uh, allergies. <clears throat> So the, the picture they showed was a, a bird on a branch right next to a thundering waterfall. Now again, we wouldn't think of that as peace, but that's the idea involved in Christ's legacy. In the time of outward peace, anyone can be at peace. Yeah. At least many can. Well, and again, that's what, you know, America, we have really, 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 really had it good. Okay? Not to say that, you know, some of us don't go through difficult times. But the reality is it's different now, but you can still have peace. Amen. In fact, it's an exceptional peace, a supernatural peace that prevails in the midst of great outward trouble or maybe even inner distress. So Christ's peace, rather, is just that. It is exceptional and it is supernatural. The peace that Christ is speaking of, not external, okay? If it's dependent on a finger 
considerable external circumstances, then you may or may not have it. Right. All right? It's not external. In fact, it's not even remotely affected by world events or personal tragedy. Right. Jesus is promising his disciples and you and me that though in their case they're going through the deepest trial of their life, they're about to go through the deepest trial of their life, and yet Jesus said, I leave you peace. Now again, there's, these words were spoken on the verge of Christ's violent execution. And they're going to experience trouble like they never experienced it before. Peace? What are you talking about? Well again, this peace that Jesus is mentioning, not dependent on favorable outward circumstances. Now again, it doesn't mean, please, write this down. This peace doesn't mean that you're going to live in perpetual bliss or perpetual happiness or prosperity. We're not talking about the prosperity gospel here. Right. We're not talking about the fact that Jesus, when Jesus said, I leave you peace, that means you're always going to be healthy, you're always going to be happy, you're always going to be prosperous. God's going to bless you so much you're going to be able to have three mansions. That's what some preachers are telling us these days. You know, the smile on their face are going to say that you're going to be super blessed. It's not that kind of thing, folks. It's not that kind of thing. The fact is, you let's take this prosperity gospel that God wants you wealthy. Let's, I, I like to do this with all Christianity. Let's lift up that and take it to a third world country and set it down. And in the words of, uh, who's the psychiatrist on TV? Real practical. Dr. Phil. Yeah, Dr. Phil. How's that working out for you? <laughs> All right. How's that prosperity gospel going to work in a country, in a Muslim country where Christians are being killed for their faith? Right. We're not talking about that, folks. And really, that's not even what God promises us. The fact is, we live in the same fallen world as non-Christians. Right. I got news for you. Christians get sick. Yep. Amen? Amen? I got news for you. Some Christians don't have three mansions. Some Christians don't even have a house. Yep, yeah. we, well, because they don't have enough faith. I, I tell you, folks, in, in, in third world countries, the faith of some of those believers will put up American Christians to shame. Amen. Yeah. Christians get sick and we die and we have trials and we have hurts. Just like everyone else, that is a fact of life. It is a fact of living in a fallen world. And Jesus did not promise us a rose garden. He did not say to his disciples before his departure, I'm going to spare you every hardship of mine. It's not the absence of external turmoil. It's not the absence of trials. It's not the absence of problems that he's speaking of. Later, he will tell his disciples, in the world, you shall have tribulation. It, that's, what, that's point number one in my sermon on how to handle trouble. Expect it. Amen. All right? It's coming. We're not talking about the absence of external or even internal, as far as our sight, problems. Because we're going to have them. In fact, the peace that Jesus is talking about here is not dependent on favorable external circumstances. It is, however, and, and I want to shout this to people. It is, however, dependent upon a good relationship with Jesus Christ. Amen. Amen. 
That's what he meant when he said, not like the world did. In fact, in essence, he's saying, I am going to be your peace. That's a different kind of peace. That's a peace that we can have when the world is falling apart. You, you might be saying, well, Brother Mike, I want that. I want that. All right. First of all, if you're not a Christian, let's, let's talk about how we get this started, all right? I, I, and by the way, this is not a, a better day sermon. Right. <laughs> the first thing I need to tell you this morning, if you do not have a relationship with God through Jesus Christ, a saving relationship, I'm not talking about whether or not you know about him intellectually, but do you know him? Have you been redeemed? Have you been born again? Have you been saved? How else can we say it? In order to have this peace that Jesus is talking about, you start with peace with God. Right. Romans 5.1 Therefore, being justified by faith, we have peace with with God through our Lord Jesus Christ. Now you're you're not going to have this peace that Jesus talked about until you have peace with God. You say, what are you talking about? Well, the word peace here, again, by the way, is the same Greek word used in John 14, 27. It comes from the verb to join. You see, the Bible describes those who do not know the Lord Jesus Christ as their Savior, as alienated from God, that is separated from God, and even worse than that, enemies of God. Colossians 1, 19-22 For it pleased the Father that in Him, that is Jesus, should all the fullest dwell, and having made peace through the blood of His Christ, by Him to reconcile all things unto himself by him, I say, whether they be things in earth or things in heaven, and you that were sometimes alienated and enemies in your mind by wicked works, now hath he reconciled. The word reconciled relationship work means to bring back together in the body of his flesh through death to present you holy and unblameable and unreprovable in his sight. Paul writing the church at Ephesus said in chapter 2 verse 11, Wherefore remember that ye being in times past Gentiles in the flesh who are called uncircumcision by that which is called the circumcision in the flesh made by hands. That at the time, now what he's talking about is before your conversion, before you got saved, before you were born again, that at that time, he said, you were without Christ, being aliens from the commonwealth of Israel, strangers from the covenants of promise, having no hope, and without God in the world. But now, that is those who have placed their faith in Christ, but now in Christ Jesus Ye who were sometimes afar off are made nigh or near by the blood of Christ. For, now listen to verse 14. For he is our peace, who hath made both one, that is Jew and Gentile, and hath broken down the middle wall of partition between us. Jesus Christ is the great reconciler. He is our peace treaty with God, if you want it. He's the one that brings us to God, who reconciles us to him so we have peace with God. And my, my hope, my sincere hope and prayer this morning, again, is everyone that is listening has had that reconciliation. You say, well, I'm not sure. It, it's pretty simple. The, the thing that makes us enemies of God is sin. Okay, sin is self-lordship. It means going my own way, doing my own thing, not regarding what God wants. It is self-autonomy, at least the attempt of self-autonomy. 
The first thing that needs to happen is you need to repent of your sin. That means to turn from it in your mind first and then by your actions, a willingness to turn from your self-lordship to the lordship of God through Jesus Christ. Amen. You don't hear a lot of preaching today about repentance because we want our proverbial cake and eat it too. Yeah. We, we want Jesus to take us to, to, to heaven when we die instead of hell. We want to go to the good place, but we don't want him to tell us what to do. Right. So we start with repentance and, and then Acknowledge that you are a sinner. Ask God to forgive you of your sin based on, secondly, what Jesus Christ has done. When he died on the cross, he died for sin, but not his sin because he didn't have any. Right. He died for our sin as a substitute. Amen. Right, you got to believe that. It, listen, Christianity is not about religion, folks. It's about relationship through Jesus Christ. Him paying and taking the penalty of our sin so that when we place our faith in Him, we are completely and fully pardoned based on what He has done. And by the way, that's past sin, present sin, future sin. It's all under the blood. Amen? Amen. And then you need to confess Him then as Lord and Savior. It kind of goes like this. I have to spell it for you. No, K-N-O-W. No, Jesus, K-N-O-W, peace. Yeah. No, Jesus, in a relationship way, you'll know peace. Right. No, N-O, Jesus. No, N-O, peace. Right. Okay? So, you, you have to start there. The, the, the world is, the mental anxiety of the world is growing. You know why? Because Christianity is waning. Because people don't have a relationship to God through Christ. All right, so to have this peace, the peace, the legacy of Christ, you must have the peace of God by repenting your sin and accepting the Lord Jesus Christ. All right, but that's only part of here. There's a peace with God that comes from being saved, but there's also the peace of God. Peace with God is automatic for those who place their faith in Christ. Peace with God. The hostility ceases. Amen. You won't go to hell. All right? You don't have to worry about that. But just having peace with God does not guarantee the peace of God. Philippians 4, 7, for example, says, And the peace of God, not with God, of God, which passes all understanding, shall keep your hearts and minds through Christ Jesus. So there's a difference between peace with God, although we start with that, and the peace of God, which again is Christ's legacy. Uh, peace with God belongs to all who believe in Christ. The peace of God can belong to all believers, but often does not. So how can we have it? Thank you for asking. But I've been dying to tell you this. All right? The, the first thing, if you have a Bible at home, you pick it up, hold this, because this is where you start. All right? Now, or your electronic device that has the Bible on. The peace of God is dependent on believing the Word of God and depending upon the Holy Spirit. Right. Belie believing the Word of God and dependent, depending rather on the Holy Spirit. Notice verse 26. Jesus speaking of the Holy Spirit says, But the Comforter, which is the Holy Ghost, whom the Father will send in my name, he shall teach you all things and bring all things to your remembrance, no here, whatsoever I have said unto you. Now, we have a written record of what Jesus said now. Okay? The Holy Spirit brings to mind the Word of God. When we are gripped by fear or trouble, the worst thing that we can possibly do 
is have amnesia when it comes to the Word of God. Or become negligent of, or continue to be negligent of the Word of God. If you're going to have the peace of God, you must be immersed in the Word of God. Because when we're gripped by fear or trouble, we often forget what God has said to us. But if we depend upon the Holy Spirit and we get into the Word of God, He will give us insight and help, help us to recall what He's promised. Just like this passage this morning, I did not predetermine to preach this on this day, you know, Many months ago, when I started, started this study, but God has ordained that we would hear what He's got to say about peace today Amen. when it's so pertinent. Right. There's no comfort like we find in the Word of God, and no comforter like the Holy Spirit who will make His Word real to us. Which brings us then. To the second point. First of all, we believe the Word of God and depend on the Holy Spirit. Secondly, claim the peace that Christ offers. Again, verse 27. This is a promise. This is a promise. This is a promise to you. Peace I leave with you. My peace I give unto you, not as the world give, give I unto you. Let let not your heart be troubled, neither let it be afraid. Boy, it's as if Jesus said, look, I got this. Right. It's, it's okay. It's okay. I mean, remember how the chapter opened, verse 1? He said, let not your heart be troubled. You believe in God, believe also in me. In chapter 16, verse 33, he said, These things have I spoken to you that in me ye might have peace. In the world you shall have tribulation, but be of good cheer. I have overcome the world. Amen. Uh, it's like Jesus saying, Don't sweat it. I got it. Right. I got this, all right? Now, again, it doesn't mean that we're passive in this. When there's some things that we need to do. Paul talks about in Philippians chapter 4. I, I call it prescription to defeat worry. In Philippians 4 verse 6 through 10. He says be careful for nothing. Careful there's again anxiety. It's just like men don't worry. Don't be troubled. Don't have agitation. Be careful for nothing. But in everything. Even in a pandemic, even in financial calamity, even in government overreach, in everything, by prayer and supplication, with thanksgiving, let your requests be made known unto God. And what does he say? And the peace of God, which passes all understanding, shall keep your hearts and minds through Christ Jesus. That, the word keep there is a, is a military term in the original language. It means to garrison. Like you would have a strong guard around you. Finally, brethren, what sort of things are honest? What sort of things are just? What sort of things are pure? What sort of things are lovely? What sort of things are good? Report if there be any virtue, if there be any praise. Think on these things. Those things which you have both learned and received and heard and seen in me, do, if you circle words in your Bible, circle that word do there. And the God of peace shall be with you. And by the way, the three things that you, you do there, correct praying. I, I love 1 Peter 5, 7. I go to that well often, casting all your care upon him. For it cares for you. There, there are some things you cannot do anything about. You can't care. A, a pandemic is one of them. <laughs> Aren't you guys amazed by all, all the experts? We're told, we're told, you need to 
lock yourself up and listen to the experts? You mean the ones who said that it's not important to wear a mask? And then a week later, you need to wear a mask. Funny how the experts uh, changed their mind. <laughs> you know why? It's bigger than them. But it's not bigger than God. Amen. Casting all your care upon him. So it starts by correct praying. Secondly, correct thinking. You know why a lot of people have anxiety and agitation in their minds? Because they don't control what they think about. And you can. He gives us the parameter here. Finally, brethren, what sort of a true, honest, just, pure, lovely, good report, virtuous, praiseworthy. He says, think on these things. No question. Has God ever given you a command to believers now, a command that you're not capable of obeying? Never. So you can't control what you think about. All right? So correct praying. And then correct action. Here's, I want to, I got to say this before I forget. God don't always rescue you from being stupid. All right? You do stupid things, you're going to get stupid results. So you got to be concerned about the way you live. Amen? He says, uh, those things, verse 9, which you have both learned and received and heard and seen in me, do. And then, he says, and the God of peace shall be with you. So we pray, pray, cast your care upon him, control your thought life, and do the right thing. Now, here, here's the thing, and you know this. God doesn't promise to take away every trial, but he does promise peace. And a sound mind through it. So claim it. Amen? Amen? And do what you need to do. Now part of this, thirdly, and, and I've been saying this all along, I know many of you believe the same thing. Uh, God is not in heaven wringing his hands and saying, Fuck, coronavirus, what am I going to do? Yeah, is there anybody that thinks that? So, thirdly, we have to accept his divine plan. A, a lot of agitation that we have in our minds and the lack of peace is simply because we will not be content. And by content, I don't mean only not wanting more things, but contentment, I think, means that we, we are saying, I am okay with what's going on. In, in the midst of this pandemic, it's saying, you know what? I, I mean, I like this, but listen, th there's a lot of things a lot worse, and I know that my God is still on the throne. My God is sovereign. My God has either directed this or permitted it. He is working, and according to Romans 8, 28, he's working good for me and for his glory. Amen, amen. And I, I'm going to trust his sovereignty. You need to understand this, folks. His sovereignty extends even to the circumstances of your life. That means that what comes into your life, he, he has either directed it or permitted it. Right. <sighs> I can rest. Because I may not be in control, but he is. Right. He is. Jesus had informed the disciples of his plain departure. We've seen that in John 13, 33 and 14, 2 and 3. But they had trouble accepting it. They had trouble accepting it. Of course, we never do. We never have trouble sure. accepting what we But they did. They needed to learn to trust him that he knew what he was doing and we need to do the same to trust him in our trials whether they work situation or sickness or pandemic or financial setbacks or whatever. We need to trust him. He knows what he's doing. Right. Fourthly, be obedient. John 14, 30 and 31 Hereafter I will not talk much with you, for the prince of this world cometh and hath nothing in me, but that the world may know that I love the Father, and as the Father hath given me commandment, 
even so I do. You want the peace of God, that's the place that you gotta go. What God tells me to do, I'm gonna do it. Facing death and Satan did not keep Jesus from calmly pursuing the Father's will for his life. The lack of peace in many believers' lives is the result of disobedience. And the solution is found in verse 31. As the Father gave me commandment, so I do. So you want the peace of God? Depend upon the Word of God and the Holy Spirit as He illumines it. Claim His peace. Accept His plan. And I admit that's the hard part sometimes. But accept His plan and be obedient. All of this can be summed up in one simple word. Trust. Amen. Trust. Isaiah 26, 3, 4. We looked at this last Wednesday night. I'll leave you with this. Thou wilt keep him in perfect peace, whose mind is stayed on thee, because he trusteth in thee. Amen. Trust ye in the Lord forever, for in the Lord Jehovah is everlasting strength. Let's pray. Lord, we thank you for your precious promises. And we, pro we thank you for the promise of peace. Lord, in your own words, not, not as the world gives, not that kind of peace, but a supernatural inward tranquility that depends upon our relationship with you. And Lord, my, my prayer, first of all, is that everyone hearing my voice this morning would have the peace of God, that they would be born again, they'd be saved through faith in Jesus Christ. And then, Lord, once they have peace with God, I pray that they have the peace of God as they appropriate it by faith. And we'll thank you for the fruits of it. In Christ's name we pray. Amen.